Let's take our Bibles this morning, Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, I'm going dis- to really disappoint some of you today because a lot of you are thinking to, myself, to yourself, hey, for 25 years in a row, the pastor has preached his annual sermon on the amount and uh, about giving, and uh, I'm not going to do that. I'm in the sermon on the mount, and next week we are going to be talking in chapter 6. It talks about the treasure of your heart and the lordship of Christ uh, the next week, but this week we want to look at something about rules. You know, there's, an, there's, a, there's a restaurant near us, very popular in fact, and uh, it's Outback. You know what their slogan is, right? What is it? No rules, just right. Well, you know, I wonder what would happen if I just decided to walk out one day and not pay my bill. I don't like that rule. So I'm just walking out and I'm gonna feel good about myself because they have no rules there. And you say, well, that's ridiculous. Actually, I tried that by mistake just a couple of weeks ago, well, a few months ago. You know, y'all are so gracious uh, to us by giving us uh, gift cards, meal gift cards during our anniversary celebration last summer. Got several from Outback. And I understand why. Not only do I like it, but if you buy $50 worth of gift cards, you get $10. And so that's not a bad deal. And so uh, we went to uh, Outback on a Sunday afternoon. And the place is just filled with church members. I mean, we must have been 80% strong there. And I, I mean, I thought to myself, this is a better place to have hospitality than, it, than here at the, ch- at the church. And so I'm, I'm kind of meeting and greeting one another, and, and uh, everybody's talking, and we sit down, and we sit down at the meal. And um, I, I pull the gift card out of my wallet and place it inside the little folder and just thought, well, they can just keep the rest for a tip. And... Uh, and we went out the door. Well, about that time, before we got to our car, the waiter came out running after us. And he said, sir, um, I think you made a mistake here. You gave me a gift card to Longhorn instead of Outback. <laughs> and that's the truth. That's, that's what I did. Well, I didn't have the Outback gift card. And so I had to just give him a credit card. He had to go in there, run the credit card, come back. And all the time I'm out there, I can just I imagine myself, a hundred people inside looking and say, wow, the pastor tried to skip <laughs> paying for this meal, and they caught him. But, you know, I could have looked at that guy and said, well, you know, that's okay. Just give me back the gift card because I don't like your rules. You know, I don't want to pay for it. But, you know, we all have rules, and society has rules in order to keep society together, keep from getting cheated, to keep from being lied to, to keep from being swindled in some way, to keep from being killed. And so society has rules in order to pull everything together. And also, God has allowed us to have laws in the Bible, and all of our rules are based upon really the Ten Commandments in the Old Testament. But we, we have these things for a reason. But is our reason what we think it is. Then you have people on the other side about rules, and they think to themselves, well, I've got to obey these rules or else I can't go to heaven. Now, I know I need to receive Jesus. That's one of the rules. I need to be baptized. That's one of the rules. I need to go to church occasionally. That's the, one of the rules. And I need to treat my fellow man right. That's one of the rules. And you, you stack up all these rules, and you think to yourself, God is so understanding. He's so understanding that the good's going to outweigh the bad, and somehow I'm going to make it to heaven. And so you begin to trust in that, and, and it's really a bondage that you're in. And so what do we do here when the Bible in this passage tells us if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. And so you're wondering why we don't have the Lord's Supper up here this morning. I'll tell you why. We didn't have space for it because at the, at the invitation on this aisle, we're going to have all of those who want their eye plucked out. And... <laughs> All of the, not want to, but need to. And all of these over here is the hand cutting line, okay? And you say, well, no, that's ridiculous. But people use that to disprove the Bible. So you see, the Bible's not applicable to any of us today because look at these two passages. How do you respond to that? Well, listen, you can take any book. You can take, uh, I don't know, the Tom Clancy series, or you can take uh, The Hobbit. You can take any, the Iliad. Uh, You can take any book, take one or two statements out of that book, and totally misinterpret the whole story, totally misinterpret the whole book. But we treat the Bible as though it's some piece of literature that's less than that. And so we want to look at the context of that, particularly in verse 48, where Jesus said, be perfect 
as my Father in heaven is also perfect. So how does all this stay, tie together in what God wants to do? Because you've heard it said before, well, you're not perfect. Have you ever heard that before? Nobody's perfect. And when somebody says, well, you're not perfect either, somebody's going to ask the question, what do you mean I'm not perfect? As though we're really telling them something they didn't know. And then how do you cure it if we're not all perfect? Those are the three points. I'm not perfect. What do you mean I'm not perfect? And number three, how do you resolve it? So we look at this passage this morning in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 17. And we look at the first point. No one's perfect. In verse 17, he's going to start talking about the law. But let me set this story for you again. The Sermon on the Mount, Jesus goes up on a mountain, a little mount. It's like really a hill leading down to the Sea of Galilee. Room for several hundred people there. And he sits down and begins to teach his disciples, those 15 or 20 at that time that were following him. But the crowd began to go, to grow and to grow and to grow because in Matthew 4 we find out he's already healing people, already getting a following. And so the crowd begins to grow, and he stands up, and he begins to teach the people around him. Now, I can imagine one Hebrew gentleman coming in and thinking to himself, I've seen the healings. I've seen what Jesus has done. I want to find out more about him. I want to find out if he's really the Messiah. He's got, he's got my attention. And this Hebrew man thinks to himself, the Messiah is going to come and overthrow the Roman Empire. He's going to come as a conquering king. In fact, what we look at Christ's second coming, they looked at his, as his first coming because they didn't see him dying on the cross, being resurrected on the third day. They thought the suffering servant role was the nation of Israel. And you can see why they would think that with all the suffering that's been taking place in Israel and the Jewish nation, uh, Jewish people over the years. And so they thought that. So he's sitting there thinking, okay, how is this, gonna, gonna, uh, this fellow going to overthrow the Roman Empire? And Jesus begins to teach them in such a way that totally uh, knocks him off his world. First of all, no one's perfect. Notice in verse 17, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've come to abolish them, but to, not to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Now, we'll come back to those last couple of words in just a few moments in our last point. But the law and the prophets, basically the law sometimes is referred to as the Ten Commandments, sometimes the first five books, most of the time, first five books of the Bible, and then the prophets is the rest of the Old Testament, but sometimes the law is even the, the entire Old Testament. And so you just look at the context of it. Well, Jesus here is talking about, in verses 21 and following, about the Ten Commandments. So that's where we're going to look at it. We're going to look at the, the law of the Old Testament, the Ten Commandments, and everything that went around that as well. And you can imagine, here's this Hebrew guy sitting in there and thinking, yeah, Jesus has not really obeyed all the law. In fact, he had healed on the Sabbath, which was against their law, at least, rabbinic law. And he had also not performed all the rituals that the Jewish nation all, often performs. And so it looked like he was not really for the law. And he says, look, I, I didn't come here to abolish the law. I've come to fulfill it. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one iota, nor not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Now this... Um, Iodo or Iota and Dot have to do with the Hebrew language, that they're interpreted. The Va of the Hebrew is uh, the smallest actual letter in the Hebrew alphabet. And there's a Dot. There's really literally a Dot called a, a Dalit. And it changes. If you look at a Hebrew language, you'll, you'll see Dots all over the place. What are these Dots? Well, if you take one Dot away, it changes the word. That's how specific it is. And he says, not anything, not one word will pass away from the Bible until all is accomplished. Some people would say, well, that's the gospel. But notice he says, well, no, until heaven and earth pass away. And another verse in the, book, in the gospel of Mark, he would say this, heaven and earth, Jesus said, will pass away, but my words will not pass away. So where does the law fit into all this? I've read recently, and uh, I haven't researched it totally, but Andy Stanley, who is a, a well-accomplished minister in Atlanta, Georgia. I've been to his church, and uh, I've kind of known him a little bit, at least, from uh, my uh, days in college. I was an intern at first uh, Atlanta for a while. And it, to, to the naked eye, it looks like he is trying to take away from the Bible in order to sort of live the way we want to live. 
And that has been the struggle, by the way, since mankind first came on the scene with, uh, you know, the sin of Adam and Eve. How can I please God? How can I worship God? How can I come to worship service like this and hold up my hands and feel good about God and still live my own life, still own me, still own my own life? Now, he would say, well, the whole law, you don't have to obey the Ten Commandments. That's what he said. Ten Commandments have nothing to do with our life. And he said he would even replace, Jesus replaced, that's the word he used, the whole Ten Commandments with one law, you should love your neighbor as yourself. Actually, Jesus, what Jesus actually said was that he could summarize the law in two things. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. He said, that's the first. Okay, you can't skip that one. That's the first four of the Ten Commandments. The last six of the Ten Commandments have to do with loving your neighbor as yourself, which is the second commandment that Jesus gave. He didn't replace it. He just summarized it all together. And so where is he coming from? Well, it could be from where he went to school, taught, teaches dispensationalism. And I'll, I'll give you the, the opportunity to research that for yourself. But basically, uh, there's seven different dispensations, just like in covenant theology. There's, there's, two co- there's, a, there's covenants. And this way, it, it's still based on some covenants, but four things, four uh, deals, you might say, with mankind and how God's going to deal with man are in the book of Genesis. And the, and the other two are in the Old Testament. Finally, the last one's the New Testament, or rather the sixth one, I should say, is the New Testament, Age of Grace. And then the second coming of Christ is going to be the last, the seventh dispensation. And so C.I. Schofield in the old uh, Schofield Study Bible, first study Bible I've ever known, ever been published, uh, taught this. And so in my generation coming up, this is kind of what was taught. And the Old Testament was certainly a great law, some of the things you ought to follow because, my goodness, they, they hold society together, but we're not beholding to them in a sense maybe really of the gospel. In other words, we can't put the law on the throne. That's not how we're going to get to heaven. That's how, first and foremost, we're not going to please God. We're going to please God with the gospel by coming to Jesus Christ and surrendering uh, our hearts to Christ. The thing is, nine out of the Ten Commandments are mentioned again in the New Testament. The only one is not mentioned again is keep the Sabbath day, you know, keep it holy. That's it. The rest of them are talked about again in the New Testament. And many of the things Jesus is teaching. So what is he really teaching here? He's saying, look, You've got all kinds of rules to guide us, to protect us against murder, uh, adultery, theft, traffic laws, health laws. Grace does not change. Listen to me. I'm going to quote this. Actually, I'm quoting myself, (laughs) you know, this time. Grace does not change the way God sees sin, only in the way that he deals with it. And so we look, and we said, he says in verse 19, therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same, we call least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them, we call great in the kingdom of heaven. But look at verse 20. The central, you say, what, where was Jesus coming from? What sin was he addressing all throughout the New Testament? This is it. Key verse, a key verse in the entire New Testament. He said this, for I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter into the kingdom of heaven. Ooh. Now, here's the guy in the crowd. He's a Hebrew. He feels like, hey, I've obeyed the Ten Commandments, but I'm not a Pharisee. A Pharisee is someone that was so really self-righteous, but he tried to be righteous. started out well, just trying to obey the law. It's like some of you saying, I'm turning over a new leaf. I'm never going to sin again. Well, you got a lot of problems in your past that you still, all that sin has to still be paid for. But that's the way they were. I'm, I don't want to sin anymore. And they started adding things to it. For example, uh, a lot of Sabbath laws were added because it's very careful you can't work on the Sabbath. So you couldn't spit because that's like plowing the ground. You could not, um, you know, right now over in Israel, you have um, elevators that are meant for the Sabbath. On the Sabbath day, it'll only go up one floor at a time, so you won't have to punch a button, okay? Because punching the button is work on the Sabbath. So all kinds of laws that were added. And people looked up to them and said, boy, if anyone's going to heaven, it's got to be the, the Pharisees. Jesus was attacking, confronting a major sin in their day. And that day was that they were thinking to themselves, because I'm of Abraham, Abraham's taking care of my sin. 
because I'm, I'm a Jewish person and I'm obeying the law, all I've got to do is do this and do that, then I'm going to be okay with God. And so I'm not looking for a savior. I'm looking for a military conqueror to get us out of this Roman imprisonment, bondage. And the man's thinking to himself, now, wait a minute. You know, he's got my attention now. Exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees. Now, wait a minute, Jesus. I've obeyed the Ten Commandments. You've heard that before. I know I'm going to be okay because I've obeyed the Ten Commandments. He says, okay, let's look at some of these commandments. He says, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to the judgment. Now, this is the Sixth Commandment, or the... uh, it simply says, you shall not do any murder. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Now you say, well, now wait a minute. God gets angry. God gets angry in a, in a righteous indignation way. He gets angry because of what our sin is doing to us and our relationship with him. We get angry out of pride, out of self-interest, self-motivation. We get angry with people. He says, well, you're liable to the judgment. Whoever insults his brother, and it means a specific type of insult here. And in in some of your versions, it gives you the the word raka. And it means to dismiss someone. It means to count them as nothing, nothing before you. There was a a politician in the same same party, in fact, this past week, that denounced the the socialism of one of his his colleagues. He's an older gentleman, and and my goodness, um, has been through... Uh, Joe Lieberman, I think it was. He was been through so many things, and and so he was commenting when they asked him about uh, one of the new congressmen, and her response was, "Who dis?" Exactly. That's exactly how it was spelled. In other words, she was just saying, "Who is he? Who who is Joe Lieberman?" Well, she knows who he is, but what she was saying is, "I'm dismissing him." That's what it means. It means like you hear a message and you just kind of roll your eyes. What are you saying? You're dismissing either me or the message. And even as a couple, maybe you're in an argument and you roll your eyes and walk off and and mumble something to yourself. You're dismissing that. That's what it means. You're just you're just counting them kind of as 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 a non-entity, as nothing. He says, if you do that, you'll be liable to the council. And whoever says you fool will be liable to hell of fire. Man, that's tough. Now, the fool is simply could be defined in, in the book of Proverbs and uh, other places in the Bible as just simply so wise in your own eyes that you can't see the harm that you're doing. So this is pretty bad. Here's, here's the guy out, out in the crowd, and he's thinking to himself, now wait a minute. Okay, you really got my attention now because I've been angry before. Have you ever, you ever been angry before? I mean, you say, well, I've never been that angry before. Hey, you ever resented somebody? You said, no, 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 I haven't. Let me ask you this. Have somebody, has somebody ever offended you that when something bad kind of happened to them, you kind of relished a little bit? They're getting theirs. That's kind of resentment. What about bitterness of the heart? Hebrews 12, 15 tells us, oh, don't do that. It cause not only deep-seated anger in your own heart, but it defiles you, defiles many people. And so we find that this is, what, this is what's happening in this passage. So if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift, therefore, before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you put in prison. Truly, I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. Now, you may be sitting here this morning, and you think to yourself, man, that's so condemning. Exactly. That's what Jesus is going for. He's trying to convince this Jewish audience they need a Savior. And the end of it, when he says, be perfect, he's not talking about just being complete. He's talking about being so perfect that you are without blemish in your own life. If you're going to get to heaven on your own, that's what it's going to take. Well, nobody can live this way. Nobody can live their life without being angry at some point. Nobody can do this. And the man in the audience there, he's thinking to himself, now wait a minute, that's impossible. There's no way to do that. Well, Jesus goes on. What about lust? He says, you have heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say that everyone who, who looks upon or looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. 
Now, notice all of these talk about the heart because that's what Jesus is getting to. He's saying, look, man looks on the outward appearance. He looks on the the result of the sin. He says, I'm looking on the heart of it. And he says, when you lust in your heart, you have sinned. You've sinned enough to separate you from God forever, and therefore you need a Savior. He said, well, then you might as well just go ahead and do the deed. Might as well just go ahead and do it. And I've heard people say that before. No, because the sin of the flesh is something totally different, has a whole different set of consequences. That is sinning right in front of man and getting out in front of everyone and hurting a lot of people around you. That is something different and a higher plane and has a whole different set of consequences than lusting in your heart. But the point is, Jesus is saying, it's still a sin. He says, well, I'll tell you how bad these sins are particularly this one he's talking about, but all of them. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it's better to lose one of your members than your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than your whole body go into hell. Everybody agree with that, right? It's better to lose your eye and go to heaven. Better to lose your right hand and go to heaven. The problem is Jesus is not saying that you're going to go to heaven. He's just simply saying, look, this is how bad these things are. There you are. You feel like, here's the man out of the crowd. I've kept all the Ten Commandments since the day I was born. Okay, okay, I, I've been angry. Okay, yeah, I lusted in my heart. Okay, but that's it, right? I mean, that's all I've done. Well, let's, let's move on. And he says this about divorce. It's also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. You'll find that in Deuteronomy chapter 24 in the Old Testament. And because of the hardness of the heart, the Bible says, Moses gave them a, a right to write a writ of divorce, not wives against their husbands, but only husbands against their wives. And put her away, and the writ was there to protect the woman. And so everyone would understand as she got married again, why she got divorced in the first place. It's to protect her. But he said, I say to you, Everyone who divorces his wife except on the grounds of sexual immorality makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Well, that's pretty strong. In fact, even Paul gave a couple of other outs in in the book of 1 Corinthians. But Jesus is saying, look, here, you think you're okay, but I came here to save you, and believe me, you need a Savior. Now, we'll, we'll look at this in Matthew chapter 19 when you come to it. But know this, divorce is not the unpardonable sin. It never has been. Sometimes we treat it as though it's okay to, to murder somebody, and you can always get forgiveness. But, boy, you've got to live with, with all the consequences of all the divorce. And let me say this, you know, if you've gone through that, you need uh, whatever forgiveness you need from God, from the cause of whatever, you need to get that out of the system and get forgiveness and move on with your life and live in victory. And God promises you that in many places in the Bible. But let's look at the oaths. What about lying? Boy, now, this is a real tough one. Again, you have heard it said, of those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven or by its throne of God or by earth or its footstool. Or by... why, why is this list? Because these are the lists that the Jewish people had. The, the, the higher you go up and you're swearing, the more consequence it was supposed to happen to you if you lied. And Jesus was saying, let your, let your yes be yes or your no be no. Anything more comes from evil. What's he talking about here? He's talking about telling the truth. Thou shalt, shalt not bear false witness. Have you ever had this before? In fact, let me, can I tell you the truth? Can I? Okay, that means I've been lying to you so far, right? Don't we say that all the time? Can I tell you the truth? Well, to tell you the truth, and that's kind of the same thing. Look, I've been lying to you before, or I haven't been totally honest with you, and now I'm going to be honest with you. And Jesus said, don't do all that. Your yes ought to be yes. You ought to tell the truth every single time. And there's not a person in this place or a person really that's ever been born that hasn't lied. I mean, let me ask you this. I mean, just on the side. Do I look fat in this? And somebody's going to say, no. Yes, I do. I look fat in everything. And there's a reason for it. But the point is, we we get nice to people. We want to say the complimentary thing. 
We've all lied somewhere. And here's the man out in the crowd thinking, oh, my goodness. By this time, tears are coming to his face. And he's seeing himself for the first time, the way God sees him. And it's breaking his heart. But then Jesus goes on because he wants to touch everyone. There's certain people in this crowd that think to themselves, oh, I've never done that. I've never been angry the way I define anger. I've never lusted the way I define lust. I've never divorced. I've never done that. I've never done this. So let's look. Verse 28 or 38. What about revenge? You have heard that said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him also the other. It's not talking here about war, somebody attacking you in your home. But in this day, what they did, you, you know, you've heard it, uh, seen it in movies before where a guy take out his white glove and go like this as an insult. Well, they didn't bother with the glove back then. They just popped him right on the face, slapped him. And this was an insult. This was embarrassing. And so instead of fighting back with an insult for insult, whether it's a physical slap in the face or insulting, you just turn the other cheek. Let it go. Wow, who can do that? Who can stand that kind of disrespect? It's hard. But then he goes on to say, if anyone would uh, sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. Now, it did talk, does talk in the Bible about Christians suing Christians and against that. But there's sometimes nothing wrong with a lawsuit. But here's the thing. Let, let me put it to you in a, in a, uh, real quickly to apply it because we're in the interest of time, a lot of verses to cover. Suppose you're a, a builder of a home, and somebody says, I need you to come and fix this. I need you to come and fix this. And finally, they just say, well, you get a letter in the mail and say, well, you know, I didn't fix it, and now I'm, I'm going to be sued. So you call the person up and say, look, you know, I've been putting this off because I've been so busy. Let me come over to your house and look at it. And so you come over and look at it and say, okay, I'll fix this, and this, I'll do it by this day. But I know there's probably other things in your house that are not done you know, perfectly. I have subs, couldn't watch them all the time. So write down those things, second mile, write down those things too. I'll fix those too. That's what he's talking about. Then he talks about something real difficult for Jewish young people. He says, if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. And this is the law of the second mile. You've heard that all your life. You know, if somebody asks you to go do this, go, do a little bit more. It goes deeper than that. A soldier could come by in any Jewish village and drop his backpack, usually very heavy. That's his whole life was right in that backpack. The Jewish boy would have to put it on his back, carry it one mile. That was the rule. One mile. Then he could just simply drop it on the ground without a word and walk back. Well, he's saying if somebody compels you to go the one mile, take that backpack at the end of the two miles. The soldier looks at the boy and says, look, you can drop it now. He says, no, I tell you what, let me go with you another mile, give you some more rest. Boy, just think about the friendship they could make on that second mile. He says, somebody asks you a one mile, go the second mile with them. And to, to a Jewish man or a Jewish young man who has done this before time and time and time again, and the humiliation of it all, and the whole village looking at him, you've got to be kidding. Then lastly, just the last one Jesus goes over. You have heard that you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Now, it never says, it never says in the Bible that you ought to hate your enemy. This was a, a rabbinical addition of the tradition of that day. But he says that you ought to love your enemies and, and pray for those who persecute you, pointing us back to Matthew 5.10 where it says the Christians are going to be persecuted. Wow, what a hard thing to do. Pray, love. And he says, he goes on to say, so that you may be the sons of the Father who is in heaven, for he makes the sun to rise on evil and the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. All the blessings come from God. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? It's easy to love those who love you. Easy to forgive those who forgive you. It's easy to treat those right in a friendly way that are friendly to you. And you may say, well, I'm not friendly to that person in the church because they're just not friendly. 
So everybody's friendly with the same people. He says, what about loving those who you disagree with politically? You know, we're in a situation in this country that I've never lived through before in my life, and that is we cannot discuss anything religiously usually or politically without an argument breaking out. We're not even listening to one another anymore. What about those who are terrorists? What about someone who has actually killed one, a person that you know? Can you forgive them? Can you love them? The man sitting there thinking to himself, the Romans killed my brother, and you expect me to love him. And by this time, he's in tears, and he's thinking to himself, Abraham's just not going to make it for me. If this indeed is the Messiah, and I, I, I hear him as one, we'll later see, as an authoritarian, someone who speaks with authority, he says, not like the scribes and Pharisees. What can I do? And you're sitting here this morning maybe and thinking to yourself, yes, God, I have broken every single one of the commandments. And you have, at least in your heart. And that is a sin within itself. So what do you do? Jesus said, I have not come to take away the law, but I have come, he says, to fulfill them, to fulfill the things of the law. How do you do that? Well, you, you have two ways that you fulfill and complete something like the law. Number one, you keep it. You just keep it. You never sin. Be perfect, Jesus said, verse 48, as my Father in heaven is also perfect. So that's one way. Nobody can do that. There's nobody here, certainly not me. My goodness, I tried to skip out of Outback. You know, don't look at me. And so the second thing, to keep it, or rather to fulfill it, is to pay for it. And there's a problem there, too, because we just can't, we can't pay for something when we're bankrupt spiritually ourselves. We, we, can't, we can't pay for what we've done. We can't make amends. All through the Old Testament, this Jewish man who is in the crowd understands all the temple sacrifices pointing to a Savior, a Messiah in the future. Now maybe things begin to come together, and he thinks, well, maybe the Messiah is coming to be that sacrificial lamb for me. Maybe the raka for me. He would die as a nothing in order for me to be something. As a nobody in order for you to become somebody. The raka that nobody wanted. The Bible says the wage of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus became that nobody so we could become somebody. In fact, it even says this in Philippians 2, 7. He emptied himself by taking on the form of a bondservant, being born in the likeness of men. The Hebrew guy's in there and he thinks to himself, okay, maybe, there, maybe there's somebody else in there and they think, okay, I'm following Jesus, I'm following Jesus. Now, I can do anything that I want to do because I'm free. You know, the Bible says that we've been set free. The truth shall set you free. You have been made free in Christ. But the problem is we don't always know what that means. We have songs today that says, I'm free, I'm free. And, and, and oh, you know, I, I could name a bunch of them that talk about that. We sing about that. What does that mean? Well, to some people that means, okay, now that I'm saved, I can, I can come and worship God and give him what, you know, maybe do some rituals along with it and get baptized in the Lord's Supper and some other rituals, and I can worship him and feel good about worshiping God and then go out and live the way I want because I'm free. No, that is the antithesis of everything the Bible teaches. Because you go out and do what you want to do, usually that means breaking the law. And if you break the law, it's going to hurt you. The law was given to protect you. You know, don't, don't go out in the street. Don't go 100 miles an hour down the middle of Oviedo. It's unsafe. There are laws to protect. There are laws to express the nature, nature of God. In fact, one of the reasons why the, the law will never go away is because it, it, it's an expression of the very nature of God. So how does this work? Well, you receive Christ, and you're set free from the penalty of sin. You no longer have to pay for your own sin. The law is fulfilled in Christ. And then 
you begin to live the Christian life because the Spirit of God has come to live inside your heart, changes your motives. Now you're not just doing something because there's a rule. You're doing things because you love God. You love people. You want to obey those two big commandments that Jesus was talking about that encompasses the whole law. Love God, love your neighbor. You want to do that. And that, that saves you and rescues you and gives you freedom from the power of sin in your life. How many people that are addicted to something wouldn't like that freedom? And finally, when you die, you're saved and you're free from the very presence of sin and all the suffering and mess and brokenness that goes with it in this world. Jesus came to set you and I free from that. Martin Luther, um, the, really the founder of the Reformation, said it this way, still obey the law, still obey the law, but it cannot sit on the throne. It can't be more than Christ. In other words, it can't be a legalistic type of thing. Well, the good's going to outweigh the bad, and, and some of the things I'm doing is receiving Christ and getting baptized. I'm doing all the things the preacher says to do and all the things the Bible says to do, and that's on the throne of my life, and somehow that's going to earn me favor with God. He said that bad stuff. God teaches against that. You put Jesus on the throne. The gospel, the cross of Jesus Christ is the way we get to heaven. He says, it can't be more than Christ, can never save you, only help you, guide you, and protect you. And so we come, we come humbly before the Lord, and we say, God, I want your freedom, so I'm putting Christ on the throne, and I know I can't obey the law, I know I've sinned. Oh, my goodness. Many, many, many times over. I mean, really, I have. And I need a Savior. And here's this man in the audience. They're on the Sermon on the Mount. And he's thinking to himself, I've got to follow Jesus. I'm going to go where he goes. Because I want to, I want to know this Savior. I want to know what he can mean to my life. And I want to know who he is. What about you today? What about you? Have you come to the place in your life where you say, you know, it's not just, okay, I'm, I'm a sinner and I need, to, I, I need salvation and I'm going to check this box, but I'm still going to have to do all these things because if I don't do all these rituals and obey these laws, then, I, you know, I, I may not be okay with God. Or you come to a place in your life where you say, God, Nothing I can do to sa can save me. And the only way I'm going to be free from legalism, the only way I'm going to be free from having to obey the law to, to my salvation and have that burden to hang over me, the only way I'm going to be free from addictions in my life and the things, the temptations that are really going to harm me is to come to know Christ as Savior and Lord of my life and put him on the throne and not myself, not the law, or anything else. And that was Jesus' goal with the Jewish nation. Come and follow me and be saved because you need, you need a Savior. With heads bowed and eyes closed. This morning, what about you? Have you really received Christ into your heart? And then I'd challenge um, before that every believer here, are you simply saying, you know, I'm, I'm saved now, and I've got that, that notch punched, and now I can just live and do whatever I want to do because I'm free or because I just kind of want to. And, you know, the, my decision, my baptism is going to kind of cover everything the way Abraham was kind of covering um, the Jewish nation or so they thought. What about you? Have you come to that place in your life? When you say, no, I'm going to surrender it all. I'm going to get with the program because that's where the blessing really comes. And then you that have never received Christ or are not sure you're a Christian, wouldn't you like to be, be sure today? Wouldn't you like to know that by trusting him and becoming free? Pray this prayer with me right now. You can pray it silently as I pray out loud. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for loving me, for sending a Savior that I needed and need so bad, so badly. And God, I open up my heart. I ask you to forgive me of all my sins 
but also the sin of just owning me. And I ask you to come into my life with all my weaknesses, my fears, my brokenness, because I know you're going to accept me just like I am. But you're going to love me too much to let me remain as I am. And so thank you, Jesus, for dying on that cross to save me. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you look this way just a moment? Brother Tim Dix ask you at the first of the message today or the first of the service to take this card and fill it out. We hope that as our guest today, we, we want to start a relationship with you. And you don't need to be on the outside looking in all the way to church all the time and just say, you know, well, it's there if I need it. You, you need relationships. And so that can begin our relationship. But on the back, it says my decision today in the upper right-hand corner. If you prayed that prayer to receive Christ, I want you to put a little check in that box. Make sure it gets in the offering plate when it's passed. And we'll make sure you're going to get the same literature that you would get if you would have come forward today. Now, you may be thinking, yeah, but I think I'd rather get the literature now. I'd rather get started now, and I'd rather just talk to a person instead of getting something in the mail or something. And so we're going to have an invitation. And during this invitation, we're going to ask people to come to the altar and just say, God, I just want to, I want to be closer to you. I want to love you more today because of what I've heard. And then others to come and greet one of our pastors. If guys, if you'll stand and just say, I prayed that prayer with the pastor. That's all you got to say to him. That's all you got to say. If you want to join maybe the fellowship of the church right now, you want to start talking about that, you may come and talk to one of these gentlemen as well. But as God speaks to your heart right now, as you just get your heart quiet before the Lord, and you ask God to help you respond in the way that you need to respond, we're going to ask you to come. Let's all stand together. And as we sing, I'm praying for you. You come. <laughs>